I really felt this weekend. First weekend back in church in New South Wales, Victoria. Uh, I think Tasmania as well. Queensland beat us by a week. I really just felt to speak about the church, the contagious nature of the church. That's the title of my message, The Contagious Nature of the Church. And of course, this is a funny season to talk about anything contagious because that's kind of the world we're living in right now, isn't it? Where uh, we've been fighting a contagion, but not everything that's contagious, not everything that's contagious is bad for you. Some things that's good to catch. Some things that's good to get on you, if you know what I'm saying. And one of those things, I think, is what is the outcome of being part of a local church. I personally love the church. You know, it's a great place to be. And some will say, well, a church is not a place, a church is not a building. And yes, it's definitely true. The building's not the church, but it becomes the church when you come along and you become part of His church in this building. So what buildings do, they're a huge blessing because firstly, they're a spike in the ground. You know, secondly, they house the church, they house the move of God. So much is only possible because of this incredible building. And of course, the buildings that we're believing for all over Australia. And so the church, is it a place? It's definitely people. It's definitely the great body of Christ. But in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 1, Paul is speaking about the Macedonian church and he talks about the grace bestowed on the churches. There it is, the churches of Macedonia. So it wasn't just one big church. There were churches in different places, reaching different people throughout Macedonia. And so we're a local church. We're just one church. Our name's Hillsong. Get in the newspaper every now and then. Hey, no biggie, no biggie. But listen to me, we are the church. And I love being a part of His church. I've been going to church my entire life. I was born into the Salvation Army. As a matter of fact, I was born in a Salvation Army hospital. It was actually a true story, Salvation Army hospital for unmarried mothers. But my mother was married just where I was born. <laughs> you know. So I was in the Salvation Army from zero to two. At two, I became a Baptist. And I was a really good Baptist, I've got to say. Mount Albert Baptist Church in Auckland. By the age of five, I was a raging Pentecostal. And well, here I still am, almost 67 years of age and still love the house of God, still love His church, still love seeing the impact of the church on the lives of people because the church is all about God and people. I went to Sunday school all my days growing up. Like kids, kids' church, I went. As a matter of fact, they had a competition for the person who can learn the books of the Bible off by heart the quickest. Learn them all off by heart and the prize was a Bible. Well, I must have been about eight or nine years of age, but I've always loved a good competition. That's why I don't play golf because if I can't win, I'm not playing, all right? <laughs> and so listen to me. I had to learn them all off by heart. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Fruit, 7, 2, 7, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 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 yeah. And I won the Bible. I got the Bible. So, yeah. And then I was part of youth ministry. I volunteered in youth. I was, you know, things were cool back there. Our youth ministry was called Christ's Ambassadors. I mean, what a cool name. And I was on the committee. Yeah. We even had a youth song. It was, We Are Christ Ambassadors. It was like really hip, you can imagine. And then I became a youth leader. Never ever got paid for being a youth pastor, I gotta say. But I was a youth pastor 
and did pretty good at it, I've got to say, for free. Well, you guys get paid all this money to be a youth pastor. <laughs> hey, this youth pastor is one of our kingdom builders, just newly married. I wouldn't call him wealthy, I'd just call him generous, fantastic. Yeah. It's all those other youth pastors that are the problem. <laughs> Why am I telling you all this? I met my wife at a church conference, a church convention. It was actually an afternoon session on the beach. And I looked down and with long dark hair in a white bikini. <laughs> I said something really spiritual. I said, I bags that one there. Yeah. And it actually took a few years, I have to say, it took a few years, it took her a while to get a revelation of how blessed she would be being married to me. But here we are all these years later. All these years later, we're still here. Yes, we are. We have got three kids when we started Hillsong. Joel was less than four. Ben was about 18 months, right? And Laura, well, she wasn't here yet. Still had the fun of conceiving her to come. It's Sunday night. You get a little risque on Sunday night, you know. <laughs> and when she was born, they put across the back of the platform pink balloons and out of pink carpet, car, cardboard, pink cardboard, it's a girl. Not pink carpet, although I wouldn't be surprised if the carpet was pink as well. Hey, so I've always been part of the church and I love the church. I love the church as much today as I have any time in my life. And you know what? I love this quote from Rick Warren, pastor of Saddleback Church, who wrote uh, Purpose Driven Life. <laughs> it's been a big weekend. The Purpose Driven Life, uh, probably the most uh, sold book in the Christian history, apart from the obvious one, the Bible itself. Listen to this quote though, I think it may even go up there. I love the church of Jesus Christ with all my heart. Despite all its faults due to our sinfulness, it is still the most magnificent concept ever created. It's been God's chosen instrument of blessing for 2,000 years. It has survived abuse, horrifying persecution. You know, we think we get persecuted. How would you like to live in some of these countries where people literally get beat up for their faith or go to prison for their faith? We're blessed here in Australia. We're blessed. And so horrifying persecution and widespread neglect. Parachurch organisations will come and go, but the church will last for eternity. That's the thing. What we are doing, what we are part of, its, it's impact is eternal. When people give their life to Christ tonight, the impact is eternal. So it's more than just let's go to church and have a good Sunday night. Amen. Eternity is at stake for so many people. It goes on and says the church will last for eternity. It's worth giving our lives for and it deserves our best. And I praise God that over many, many years now, there's been so many people who have literally given our church their best. JFK said this, John F. Kennedy, president of America in the 60s and assassinated in Dallas. Maybe there's young people here who don't even know the story. But I'll tell you this, he, he was known for some memorable quotes, but one of them was this. He says, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. But I'm turning that round tonight and saying, I don't wanna to talk to you about what you can do for the church, our church. I wanna talk about what our church can do and is doing for you so that we can have an appreciation of what it is to be part of a life-giving, healthy local church. Amen. So am I biased? Am I biased? Of course I'm biased, I'm a pastor. Am I biased? Yes, I am. But I'll tell you right now, I couldn't think of a better way to have spent our adult lives than being a part of God's great church. And I'm so thrilled today. We've got three kids, they're all growing up. In fact, my oldest son is over 40 years of age, but they're still part of the house. 
eight grandchildren, they're all part of the house. Most of them at this age, they don't have any choice really. But I just am so grateful that we have the opportunity to build that kind of inheritance, uh, heritage into the generations. It's beautiful. It's powerful. One time I saw something that really blessed me because we were having our heart for the house. Our heart for the house is a once in a year, very special weekend in our church or a couple of weekends where people are sacrificial and it's enabled us to make so much progress with buildings and uh, facilities and also to support and help so many people in so many ways and Vision Rescue and A21 and all these other things, City Care, of course, 180TC, all these things that we are able to be a part of. But one person from our city campus here in Sydney, they said, I have a heart for the house because the house first had a heart for me. And I pray that'll always be the way, that we will always be a church that has a heart for you, a heart for people who love people and love the fact that it's not just the church, it's His church. And He loves His church. As a matter of fact, for us husbands, the gold standard for the way we should love our wives is the way Jesus loves His church. In Ephesians chapter five, I think it is, listen to it. It talks about the way Jesus loves His church. And it says, verse 23 or verse 24, it says, verse 25, <laughs> husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for her. And so the gold standard when it comes to loving the church is Jesus. He loves His church. And God, I believe, He loved His Old Testament house, the temple, and He loves His New Testament house, His church. It's His church. It says in the Scripture, unless the Lord builds the house, they labour in vain that build it. It's His church. We just get the honour of going along with Him in the building of His great church. In 1 Kings chapter 9, talking about that Old Testament house, in verse 1, it says this, after Solomon had completed building the temple of God and his own palace, makes me smile that one, all the projects he had set his heart on doing, God appeared to Solomon again, just as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. And God said to him, I've listened to and received all your prayers, your ever so passionate prayers. I've sanctified this house, this temple that you have built. This is what I love. My name is stamped on it forever. My eyes are on it and my heart is in it always. What are we talking about? The house of God. His name is stamped on it forever. My eyes are on it and my heart is in it, the Lord says. And that means as part of His church by default. I believe His name is stamped on you. His eyes are on you and His heart is for you. And that's a beautiful, beautiful beautiful thing for us to remember. Thank God for His house. You see, the promise is for this blessing on His house. Some of you will be familiar with all these verses, but Matthew 16, verse 18, when Jesus is talking to Peter and He tells him, Peter must have forgot his name. He said, your name is Peter. But that name Peter, Petrus, it's like a small rock. And so your name is Peter, like pebble or small rock. But upon this rock, with a different inflection on the word, big rock, upon this rock, Jesus, I will build my church. The church is never built on a man. Church is built on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It's His church. He's the Lord of the church. It's His church. And the God, this verse goes on. It says, listen to it. I will Build my church on Jesus, the rock, and the gates of hell, Hades, shall not, cannot, will not prevail against it. And I'll give you the keys of the kingdom and whatever you bind on earth will already have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will already have been loosed in heaven. In other words, there's an authority, an authority that came to Peter when it came to being a part of God's house and when it came to the authority he had as a man of God. Well, listen to me. I really thank God 
for the blessing that's on his house. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. It doesn't mean at times that hell won't try to prevail against you. Sometimes it feels, doesn't it? Like all hell breaks loose against us. But as a part of his house, the promises, the gates of hell will not, cannot, shall not prevail against you, the church of Jesus Christ. The gates of hell cannot prevail against his people, the church. No wonder, no wonder we should be filled with joy at the opportunity to be a part of his great house. There's blessing on the house. I find the church to be remarkably resilient but remarkably resilient, what the church withstands and just continues to move forward healthy and seeing lives transformed and seeing God do great things. And not only is there blessing on the church, but there's blessing on you, the people of His church. And again, listen to Psalm 84 verse four, talking about the house of God. It says, blessed are those who dwell in your house, they will still be praising you. Blessed, blessed in the Amplified, happy, fortunate and to be envied are those who are part of the house of the Lord. Those who dwell in your house, they are still praising you. You see, maybe challenge does come. Maybe a coronavirus pandemic does hit. Maybe your job has been threatened. Maybe you and your business is struggling. Perhaps there's other things that are direct results of this season. But you know what? We're here and we're still praising Him. Nothing's gonna hold us back. We're still praising Him. You're here. We're still praising Him. And in the middle of it all, (coughs) God turns so much around and tests become testimonies. And that's always such a good thing. You wonder why I stopped? I just sort of loving you and checking you out. I haven't seen you for a long time. And some of you got a little bigger. <laughs> I'm in that club, unfortunately. <laughs> it's just so nice to be back. It's quite moving, to be honest. It's just moving. In fact, the Scripture talks about the will of God for the people who are part of His house. It's in Psalm 92, verse 12. And it says, the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Listen to it. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Those who are planted in His house shall flourish. They shall still bear fruit in old age. When I get old, I'm looking forward to that. Amen, still bearing fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. How good is that? Well, that's my prayer. Pastor of our church, I pray for people's marriages to be flourishing, for your family to be flourishing, for your your endeavours to be flourishing, for what's going on inside of you. In other words, your well-being, that you're flourishing. Amen because it's, that's God's will for those who are part of the house of the Lord. And to be honest with you, as pastors of our church, can I, can I tell you, I take that very seriously. If it's the will of God for the people who are part of the house of God to flourish, then I pray we will always be committed to creating the kind of environment where people can flourish, where ceilings are lifted off people's lives and where truly people have the opportunity to see the kind of potential that God has for them. Those who are planted in His house shall flourish in the courts of our God. And I think there's a grace on the leadership of a church. And I'll explain what I mean by a grace on the leaders. You see, it directly relates to you. Ephesians chapter four, verse 11 and 12, talking about all these different ministry gifts, apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, evangelists. Have a look at it there, verse 11. It says, He Himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. But what for? What are those people for? They're there for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. In other words, you're you're not here for, for me. We're actually here to see the equipping of God's people. 
for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, the building up of the body of Christ. And what is the work of the ministry? It's definitely not just what I do. It's whatever God called you to do. Some of you, your calling or your ministry, maybe in education, in the arts, it may be in, in uh, technology, it may be in small business, it may be in large business, it may be a trade, it may be one of many, many things. All I pray is that we'll be the kind of church that equips people to flourish. And that's the grace that I think is on church leadership and those with the, what's called ministry gifts in Ephesians 5 for the equipping of people to reach and influence the world by building a large Christ-centred Bible-based church. This was written in the early 1980s to reach and influence the world by building a large, we were far from large, a large Christ-centred Bible-based church, changing mindsets and here it is, empowering people to lead and impact in every sphere of life, in every sphere of life to lead and impact. So let me tell you my prayer for the church. I wrote years ago, remember? The church I see and now in 2013 when we turned 30 years of age as a church, I wrote the church I now see. And uh, now we're believing to see just like we did from what was written in 1993, the church I see become almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. We're believing now to see so much of the outrageous vision that's in the church I now see. Well, listen, I love these lines. I see a church that loves God, loves people and loves life. Youthful in spirit. Yeah, youthful in spirit. Generous at heart. Faith-filled in confession. Loving in nature, in nature and inclusive in expression. Youthful at spirit, generous at heart, faith-filled in confession, loving in nature and inclusive, inclusive in expression. That's my prayer for our church. I believe that we can be a church where God is moving, where salvation is flowing, where momentum is growing, where the Holy Spirit is moving, where business people are thriving, where marriages and families are blossoming, where there's a sense of buoyancy and unity, where the air is light and the atmosphere is warm, where there's good reports and testimonies, generosity and encouragement abounds. I pray we will be a church that glorifies Jesus Christ. Amen, that our worship will always be focused toward Him because it's His church. It's His church and the promises for His church. The gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Amen. So as part of the church, what is it, what do I believe is the contagious part of that? What is it you can catch? What gets on you? Well, firstly, I want us to be a church where people are inspired to aspire. In other words, inspired to dream, not inspired to expire. <laughs> inspired to aspire, to dream. There's a world out there where dreams are shattered. There's a world out there of brokenness and a world out there where maybe people's dreams became a little girl's fairy tale that turned into a nightmare or a, a young boy's dream that has turned into a broken heart. May this be a place where we challenge people and inspire people to keep dreaming big dreams. Amen. And some people will even say, well, what if you're giving people false hope? What if they don't even have all that in them? You know what I say? If you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. Is that what we want? To just teach young people to aim at nothing and hit that every time? The Bible says, without vision, people dwell carelessly. You wanna know why young people rebel often? It's because their life lacks vision. And when people dare to, to have vision and dare to dream, even if they only get part way there, they're still gonna do a whole lot more than if they just did nothing. True? That's not a good clap. Let's, let's really give it a good clap. Come on. Let's give it a good clap. No. Uh, <laughs> I'm on strike, I'm on strike. Yeah, I'm gonna tag you, Richard, you're in, all right? No, 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 we'll be here all night if that happens. So listen. That was a little hurtful, wasn't it? 
Yeah. You've been here for so many years now, I reckon you're going to be here next week as well. <laughs> and even if you didn't want to be, guess who's going to be dragging you along? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> you know what I love about the church? I love the fact it's generational. In other words, you know what God does, it's not just for a generation. It impacts children and children's children and so much of the promise of God is not only for our children, but for our children's children. Here's a man right here, a big muscly man in the front row. His mum and dad, part of our church, he was almost born into our church, played the first 15 Kings rugby, but it was a long time ago. And, uh, and now here he is on the front row in church, works for City Care, and now with two kids, and they're in the house of God, it's generational. And in the Kingdom of God, the generations get stronger, not weaker. So thank God for that. One generation shall praise your works to another and declare your mighty acts. Psalm 145 verse four. And I watch the generations get stronger. I watch young people and you know, often kids who grow up in church, they've got a confidence about them. And it's a godly confidence, it's not arrogance. It's a godly confidence and I see so many of the kids who grow up part of church and part of a youth ministry I see them become school captains and you know, class captains and take on roles in leadership. And, and again, it's one of the blessings of the church. Our youth group is to me is a leadership factory. So many of the great leaders in our church have come through wildlife, was well, fuel first, sorry, forgot fuel, fuel, then wildlife and then powerhouse and then frontline and then super seniors. I promise you one thing, one thing, I will never, ever, ever go to the seniors group in this church. <laughs> never, never. I'd rather go along to wi wildlife or whatever it's called and get chucked out. They get chucked out, but I'm not going to no seniors group. It's where old people go. <laughs> you think I'm joking? I'm not joking. I love the seniors. I'm sure you have an awesome time together. <laughs> Memory lane and all that, remembering, reminiscing, must be amazing. Problem is when you get a little older, you can't even remember what happened five seconds ago, but somehow you still remember what happened 45 years ago. Not for me, not for me, no. You're all kind of nervous tonight, I don't know. It's like, <laughs> I might go, nah, <laughs> nah. Hey listen, I love the fact that lifelong friendships are built in church. Iron sharpens iron. You know, such, it's such a lonely place, Sydney. Such a lonely place for so many people. Often the bigger a city, the more lonely it is. And a church, there's community. And, and this, see, this is what I love. There's a sense of community and family. And uh, we're not just a crowd. We're, we're a family, we're a community. And it, we see it when someone dies and our pastors are there doing a funeral, weeping with those who weep. Or the wonder of a marriage and our pastors are there and people are there rejoicing with those who rejoice. And we see it in the hospitals and we see it in so many ways where people are being reached. Do you know, during this pandemic season, since we got together three 273 days ago, 273 days ago was the last time we were in church like this. And you know, in that time, our pastors have literally reached, Margaret, can you remember how many people it is now? Last I heard, 365,000 different people had been reached by our pastors for pastoring, for prayer, for, for just fellowship, for connecting with people. That is colossal. It's colossal. So thank God for each and every single one of them. I love the fact the church is a commissioning place. We send people out. We've sent some of our best all over the globe. I think about Chris Mendez, Lucy Mendez, 
in South America right now, the Dooleys, where our youth pastors years ago, now in South Africa, you know, tearing it up there. I mean, I see people all over the globe and it's a joy that we've been able to send and send people out. But it's, you're not going anywhere, all right? All right, I'm sick of sending people. <laughs> Uh, I laugh at my own jokes because no one else does. <laughs> hey, listen, the church in Antioch in the New Testament. You guys can come up if you want. Where are you? Oh, come on, come on. Hey, listen to me, this church in Antioch. It's talking about their leaders in Acts chapter 13, verse two. It says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And so that's what they did. In the church of Antioch, they separated Barnabas and Saul and having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and they sent them away. They didn't just send them away to get rid of them. They sent them on the great missionary journeys of the New Testament, of the book of Acts. And so they sent them so that they impacted from the church in Jerusalem, this time in Antioch, they impacted the then known world with the Gospel of Jesus Christ. There's so many wonderful things about being part of His church. So many wonderful things. Like I just see a guy down here, his name's Nathan. I don't even know his surname. I just know his Instagram is Nathan Sports App. <laughs> People say, I say Nathan. They say, Nathan, you know Nathan Sports App. Yeah, Mrs. Sports App right beside him there. Well, you know what? Being part of a local church, I was at the tuck shop a few months ago now. It's up near where we live. and The lion was out the door. And I'd been there a few minutes and the lion didn't even move. So Nathan sports app, he says, do you want me to order it online? I'm going, sure. So he did that and they said, look, it'll take however long, 20 minutes. But my coffee was there in two seconds. That's being part of a local church. See what happens? And I didn't even pay the bill. <laughs> you know, Sunday night's supposed to be fun. I hope you're okay with it. Yeah. Look. We can, we can go into Sunday 11.15 a.m. mode if we want, but that's for the seniors group. <laughs> I love being part of the church. You know, one of the great blessings of the church, I told you I met my wife through a church convention. Yeah, one of the great, you meet your life's partner there. I mean, better than meeting them online. It might not even be a real person. <laughs> or it may be a very far cry from who you think you're talking to. <laughs> Better than meeting them at the pub. The house of God as the place to meet your partner. You do life together. <laughs> the greatest blessing of the church is you, people. And Bobby and I have been so blessed, and I'm dead serious now, to have pastored this church for over 37 years. Couldn't have imagined a greater joy. When I moved to Australia in 1978, I had no idea where Borkham Hills was, let alone know what God could do out of this place to impact the globe. And we'll always be grateful for every single one of you who call Hillsong home. It's the most wonderful blessing. We're not a perfect church. It might be if you've got a perfect pastor. We're not a perfect church, far from it. But I believe we're a church that has a heart for you, for people. And I pray we will always be that church. Can you say amen? Amen, amen. amen. Let's stand together, shall we? The Bible is so clear about salvation. How that Jesus can forgive you from sin. Break its hold, break its power in your life just like He has for every person who knows Jesus as Lord, because every one of us are sinners. Thank God we can become sinners saved by grace. And when Jesus takes a hold of a life, He literally not only lets you get away with your past, He forgets about it. He'll remember your sin no more. The Bible says as far as the East is from the West, so far has He removed your sin from you. 
It's a brand new start. That's why they call it being born again, a brand new start. And the Scripture says, if you will ask Jesus into your life, He will come in and He will live in you. You ever prayed a prayer like that? You ever made a conscious decision to surrender ownership of your life to the Lord Jesus Christ? He loves you. Online as well, you can pray this prayer that I'm about to lead people in. And a matter of fact, if you write in the chat, whether you're on YouTube or or whether you're on hillsong.com online or wherever, you're part of the service. You can write into the chat in a minute. I'm praying that prayer. I prayed this prayer. It's a prayer of salvation and it's eternal. You see what Jesus does is eternal. This is about eternity. It talks about the wages of sin being death, but the gift of God is what? Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's eternal and tonight can be your night, a night of salvation, a new beginning. Your failures and your sins, He remembers no more. Old things are passed away, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. This is that night. And maybe at some point you followed Jesus, but He's not the one who moves. He doesn't unsave people. But we can be making choices and decisions that have us living alienated, separated from God's will. Oh, what a perfect night tonight to make your peace with God. Can we have every eye closed, every person in prayer, everywhere? And if you say, Brian, when you pray for people, when you pray this prayer for people to give their lives to Jesus, to be born again, to have this brand new start, to see their sins forgiven and buried in the deepest sea of His forgetfulness. When you pray for people to make their peace with God, to turn from their backsliding and get right with God. Brian, would you include me in that prayer? I would just so love to pray for you. So this is what I'm gonna do. As we always do here, I'm gonna count to three with people's eyes closed. And on three, I'm gonna ask every single person who says, Brian, please include me in that prayer. On three, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand in the air. You want me to pray this prayer and include you, this prayer of faith in Jesus. You raise your hand on three and you won't be the only one. I'm believing there's gonna be many, many hands tonight. And online, there's gonna be many, many people who will pray this prayer. And so you're ready on three. You say, Brian, please pray that prayer and include me. A prayer asking Jesus into your life on three. You raise your hand. A whole lot of you will raise your hand and then we're all gonna pray together. So you ready for that? Ready to raise your hand on three? Here we go. One, two, three. Lift them up now, lift them high. Lift them high. Thank God for you. Thank God for you. I can see hands raised by the way. All around the room, I can see hands raised. All the way up toward the back, I can see hands raised. And it's powerful and it's beautiful and I love it. And you know what? I'm not sure what we're even allowed to do with social distancing. I get in trouble all the time, but I'd love to pray with you guys. I'd, I'd love to see you guys just come stand here, just stay about a metre apart. If you know how far that is, it's about this far. And uh, just come stand here. There'll be lots of you because I saw lots of hands. Just come stand here. And I'll pray for you. I'm going to pray for each one of you. Every one of you is important to God. Nothing about your past needs to frame your future because of Jesus. And I think that's incredible. And so every single one of you, I wanna pray for you. I'm gonna to believe tonight to be a very powerful night in your life. And don't forget when we invite Jesus into our life, it's eternal, it's eternal. I think heaven sounds a whole lot more exciting than hell. So tonight, amen, you're coming into the Kingdom of God in Jesus' Name. So together, big church family, let's pray this prayer, everyone together. Dear Jesus, this is the moment. I surrender my life to Jesus Christ. I confess my sin and I thank You, You're faithful and just to forgive my sin, to give me a brand new start. From this night, I'm a child of God, a new creation, a follower of Jesus Christ. Thank You for Your love and grace. I am a believer. Jesus is alive in me. Come on, give them one more big, big congratulations. 
Congratulations.